Yep. Okay. So uh, you heard a reference to the uh, meeting that took place uh, Thursday and Friday um, that Rex and I uh, co-chaired. Um, we called it uh, Characterizing and Displaying Genetic Variants for Clinical Action. And this was sponsored by the National Human Genome Research Institute and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so we uh, actually had uh, represent, uh, representatives from um, uh, the UK, uh, United States, and uh, a few uh, from scattered other places. The goal of the meeting was to consider processes, databases, and other resources that were needed to identify clinically relevant variants, decide whether or not they are actionable and what the action should be, uh, and to provide information for clinical use. Uh, the idea being that this would be something that could provide an infrastructure assist to uh, more rapidly disseminate and implement. Uh, I'm not going to go through the um, uh, planning committee, but uh, uh, here are the uh, usual suspects, um, and many of you are here again today. Um, the rationale for putting this meeting together was that uh, we were um, getting a lot of uh, data around uh, variants of potential clinical relevance. Uh, but that while we were collecting um, information about the variants and to some degrees about the associations, there really uh, wasn't any sort of systematic uh, effort uh, to collect, synthesize, and then evaluate, most importantly, um, these findings as to whether or not there was uh, clinical um, ability to use the information. And um, the organizers thought it would be critical to obtain a consensus on what variants are actionable and what specific actions should be taken on, given the context of the variant and the clinical scenario. And then to try and develop a, uh, a, a way that we can make the information available to clinicians, uh, primarily through the opportunity of, of making it consumable by, by electronic health records. Now, as I was thinking about these, um, I tried to think what are the things that would be most relevant uh, to this group, and at least out of these four, uh, backgrounds, I think, uh, you know, these last two are the ones that are probably the most relevant uh, for the work that uh, those of us in the room are doing. Now, um, we had heard from several groups uh, that uh, there was a real need for a centralized resource. Uh, there was uh, um, uh, this genomics and health information technology systems uh, uh, that indicated this, the IOM working group, there's an NHLBI workshop and integration, but most importantly, this was one of the issues that emerged from our uh, genomic medicine uh, meeting in June, uh, that this type of uh, um, infrastructure was really desperately needed. So the output of that meeting, uh, which is going to be presented here at an extremely 50,000-foot uh, um, uh, version, um, was some annotations. Uh, I need to thank Aaron uh, Ramos uh, uh, from NHGRI who put these slides together, and then uh, Rex and Terry uh, who helped to edit them. Um, so, so these are some of the organizing questions that came out of the meeting. Um, do we have adequate and accessible data for making decisions about clinical actionability? And the answer is it depends on the audience. Uh, that there are some starting points. Uh, ClinVar has been mentioned previously. Uh, Ensemble is a um, uh, European equivalent. Um, and these are good starting points. Um, but they probably don't have all of the information, certainly don't have the annotation. Uh, and updating functions that would allow us to know that the information about a specific clinical action uh, is uh, supported by good evidence uh, and is up to date. Um, it's clear that there's more data that is needed. This will be a, uh, reassuring to anybody, anybody in the room that's heavily involved in doing uh, large-scale sequencing. Uh, there were many calls for more data, especially uh, trying to increase the diversity of populations uh, that are being sequenced so we have a better sense of the prevalence of variants across uh, diverse populations. Um, and that uh, we need to make sure that the database uh, is going to be able to consume and represent um, these uh, population-based data. The, there's a significant need for clinical annotation associated with variants in genes uh, 
especially uh, because there are so many of the variants uh, that have unknown significance. And so capturing those, um, you know, accruing information around them is going to be very important. And I think one of the things that emerged from this particular meeting is that there's, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely uh, that this is going to be able to be done as a centralized function. This is something that probably all of us are going to have to participate in. And so really the um, uh, point of the resource will be how can the resource consume uh, all of the decisions that all of us are making about whether or not we should be acting on a given uh, variant. Uh, there was also uh, the indication that uh, it would be useful for this resource to also um, uh, capture somatic variation. Uh, we need a, me a mechanism to capture one-off associations. Again, this was the question of uh, as we look um, uh, for the missing heritability, there's at least some reasonable evidence to suggest that some of it uh, is probably in rare high impact variants that are uh, perhaps even uh, localized to individual families. Uh, we have to be able to uh, capture these and annotate them as well. Um, we, we, the, the bullet comes out primary care docs, but I think the reality is all uh, docs and other healthcare professionals will need user friendly clinical decision support tools uh, with uh, integration into electronic health records. Um, and the database uh, needs to be able to carefully model uh, classes of evidence and needs to understand in particular things uh, like uh, prevalence and prior probability uh, to be able to make sense of what's going on. And I would say that all of these bullets listed under these two slides are potential opportunities for the pilot projects uh, in our genomic medicine group uh, to uh, take on and explore. <coughs> Second question, what criteria need to be met to consider a genetic variant or pattern of genetic variants clinically actionable? Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, sentiment that the real focus, at least at the screening level, should be on clinical validity, that it might be relatively easy if we can say this is, uh, we clearly have clinical validity or we don't, to at least use that as a first pass to be able to uh, focus on which variants we think are most likely. Uh, to uh, have some clinical impact. And so uh, the idea of taking the, the, the low-hanging fruit, uh, using uh, genes that we already know and uh, trying to uh, characterize variants in those genes that uh, we don't have information about, um, and characterizing those in terms of their actionability and utility could be developed now. And again, I think given the projects that we've seen out of this group, uh, this would be something where uh, individuals or consortia of groups uh, in the genomic medicine group uh, could work on how do we actually do this? How do we do this binning process, if you will? Um, and I think that there was also the recognition that this type of characterization of the different variants into um, is this something that is clinically actionable? Is this something that's promising but needs more information? or something where we don't have enough information to use. It's a different uh, process than what a clinical laboratorian does in terms of trying to determine is a variant pathogenic or not. Um, and we need to develop processes that will be able to support both. And I think there was a fair amount of um, uh, concern in the room uh, between the laboratorians that are in the process of having to put out reports when they find something versus the clinicians consuming those reports and then saying, okay, well, they found a variant, what do I do about it? Um, and the point was uh, made that, you know, uh, we uh, as clinicians, when we're sitting in the room with the patient, we have to make a decision and that decision is a binary decision. Do I do something on this variant or do I not do something on this variant? Uh, there's not a, well, we're, we'll have to wait until uh, the data comes. We still have to make clinical decisions based on that information. Um, we should um, uh, ignore at this point bins with no validity and uh, the point was made that uh, we should treat variants of unknown significance as innocent until proven guilty as opposed to the converse and this is uh, the situation, um, the example of uh, that was uh, specifically used in a talk was missense variants in a well-characterized gene such as BRCA where the evidence uh, 
shows that if you have a truncating mutation in BRCA, you can almost be assured that that's of clinical significance, but that there's very few missense variants that have really been demonstrated convincingly uh, to be um, uh, pathogenic. But if uh, we treat all of them as uh, pathogenic when they're in the unknown category, then clinical decisions can be made that can have significant consequences, particularly when we're looking at interventions such as uh, prophylactic mastectomy, uh, salpingo oophorectomy, or these types of things. And so uh, the idea being that if you don't have a family history, you have an individual where you find a variant, uh, the prior probability of um, that individual uh, being at risk is relatively low, and therefore we should take that into account. So that was an, an interesting discussion and something that I think we need to um, uh, characterize, and of course the primum non notre uh, do no harm. What is needed to integrate genomic variants and evidence into EHR and clinical use? Um, uh, we clearly will be needing decision support, and uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm for developing a, a library of clinical decision support tools or open source uh, clinical support that would be uh, formatted in such a way as to be consumable by uh, standards-based electronic uh, health records. Again, a lot of us around the table here have relatively sophisticated electronic health records, and we're interacting with those teams. And if we are developing uh, decision support rules around some of the activities that we're doing, uh, I think we should also look for opportunities to say, hey, we developed this algorithm. Is this something you would like to take and play with? Uh, this is needed to address scalability and access. Um, it needs to be able to draw from multiple sources. There needs to be integration. Uh, therefore, it has to be based on standards. Uh, and this would include uh, alignment with uh, HL7. So there was a strong sentiment to begin to include representatives of the uh, uh, genomic medicine uh, working group of HL7 in some of the work that we're doing. Uh, again, we're not doing a great job even with the uh, genes that we really know we need to be paying attention to, and so in some ways we should use those as our opportunities to learn, and that are, those are the types of genes that we're working on um, because we recognize that this is where the implementation can have the biggest value, uh, and so I think we really have the opportunity to uh, move this forward. Uh, ClinVar, um, uh, could this be the central repository for variant information? I think there was uh, a sense in the room that this would be uh, a good place, although there are obviously other opportunities as well in terms of ensemble. And so the resource that we began to talk about was something that would sort of sit on top of these other resources and would add in an annotation function uh, related to them. One of the things that I think is most important for this group is the idea of creating uh, what we were characterizing as a dynamic loop. So not only do we want to move actionable variants into clinical practice, but we also want to evaluate outcomes and take those outcomes data and feed them back into the databases to be able to uh, refine uh, variants. In other words, do uh, crowdsourcing in terms of learning about what is the actual impact as we implement uh, programs based on these um, uh, variants. And so this, again, would uh, impact curation function. Uh, it was recognized that we probably need to uh, uh, generate better interactions between epidemiologists, bioinformaticians, and genomic scientists uh, to facilitate obtaining the needed information on clinical validity and utility. I think that this, um, some of us are beginning to explore the space in our individual institutions. Uh, there was also a call to perhaps um, establish some training opportunities to uh, cross-train uh, some of these individuals. Um, the, uh, also, when we uh, update information about a variant, it, we need to have versioning of this so that we know when it was done and on what information um, uh, was used to make that. Um, we recognize opportunities that there are large databases of uh, data, such as the Medco, um, where we heard uh, a presentation from them, where they have a, a bunch of data, and if the, uh, the research question they're trying to answer is amenable to using the data set, we might be able to move very quickly using existing data uh, to uh, develop some at least preliminary answers on some of the questions that we're looking at. So there's an opportunity to try and collaborate uh, and broker uh, relationships. Again, a very important function of this group. We really need to develop approaches to uh, get, uh, gather long-term follow-up um, on patients with uh, rare variants. Uh, 
to understand the relationship of the variant to the disease and uh, other phenotypes. Um, there is the recognition that there are concerns about privacy, uh, security issues uh, that in some ways have hindered uh, this research. Um, but there's also uh, was the concept uh, that perhaps hasn't been explored as much uh, in this group and something we should think about is uh, what if patients have access uh, uh, to the data and actually control the data. And I know that that's something that partners in particular uh, has been quite interested in and that's something to see. Is that a model that could potentially uh, be uh, scalable? And um, I think that our projects, uh, as we look at them, should incorporate pilots in terms of how to explore the best ways to communicate outcomes results from the clinic back to researchers and define how we can move um, nimbly but without viol uh, violating any rules and regulations between the clinical and research spaces. Um, decision support in physician uh, education, um, the, the sort of the signature project that was raised is, you know, I want something, I think Gail uh, brought this up, I want something where you can feed uh, whole genome data into software that produces a concise report regarding relevant genomic variants for a particular patient. I think that's uh, definitely a holy grail type of a, um, a situation, but for those of us that are moving into whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing in the clinic, um, I think as we recognize uh, the amount of intensity that goes into uh, doing the interpretations, if we can find ways to automate this, that would be highly useful. Um, clinical decision support systems need to be scalable. Uh, clinical decision support to this point has been pretty much institution specific. We all build our own. Uh, they don't generally work in other places. I think we're beginning in eMERGE to uh, uh, call uh, for the need of being able to build something that will then work in other places with minor modifications. We should uh, uh, pursue that uh, more. Uh, I mentioned the patient controlled information. Um, we need to be thinking about what are the sort of educational support that needs to go along with uh, the uh, variant information to uh, providers. Um, and we probably need to do some general consciousness raising about um, uh, the fact that some of the information that, we're, that uh, we're using in fact does have utility and can improve patient care. Um, and all of these uh, I think represent uh, opportunities for this group. Um, these are the draft recommendations and I'm not going to um, I go through those in great detail. I'm, I'm assuming that the slide set will be uh, distributed to uh, the attendees. And this will also be the, uh, um, there will be a paper that will be coming out about this, hopefully on a relatively uh, rapid uh, time scale. Um, but what I wanted to do was to take um, a couple of things that I thought would be um, most important for this group uh, to uh, kind of think about. Um, First of all, I think the recognition that the recommendations from this group were in fact responsive to uh, the uh, recommendations that we had out of the June meeting. Uh, that we have um, a pretty good working relationship, probably because there's a lot of us that sit in both groups uh, that allow liaison. Um, I think it would be critically important for this group to provide input uh, and uh, constructive criticism as the database resource is being developed. Uh, as I mentioned through the course of the um, different questions, there are several of the recommendations that lend themselves to pilot projects that could be added to the implementation programs. And so should, we should be thinking critically about how that could be done and the role that NHGRI might play in terms of fostering that type of um, uh, pilot program. Um, I think the genomic medicine group needs to provide input on some of the questions about variant classification that were raised by the other group. I think, again, we're, um, the, the majority of us in this room are in the process of doing it, meaning we've addressed these questions in our individual institutions. What are we going to act on? What are we not going to act on? Uh, and that type of information will be critically important as we build this resource. Um, we need to uh, not only understand our successes, but also our failures related to varying classification. Um, and I think in part as we look forward to meetings of this group um, to decide whether or not a portion of uh, or a meeting of this group in the future should be around this particular uh, activity. Um, I'm going to say one other thing before uh, I open it up to uh, questions. Uh, and that is that um, in addition to the uh, ClinAction meeting that we had and this meeting, I wanted to just let you know of one other uh, 
um, uh, thing that uh, impact that we will potentially have that Terry briefly mentioned in her remarks, and that is uh, three representatives of this group um, will be presenting a, a workshop at the uh, um, NIH dissemination and implementation meeting that's going to be taking place in May. Uh, of 2012, uh, NHGRI is sponsoring um, uh, this workshop, and uh, I think this will be a very interesting uh, venue uh, to um, basically put this work out in front of uh, people whose uh, focus is on dissemination implementation science and really get feedback from um, the group that is perhaps not quite so inbred uh, as us to say, is this uh, the right way uh, to go about things? So what suggestions can we have to move things uh, forward? How can we incorporate the um, uh, tools of uh, dissemination and implementation science into our work? So with that, I'll stop and uh, uh, entertain any questions that you might have. Or, and also ask uh, Rex or Terry if they have any additions or any of the other people that were at that meeting. David. Yeah, so it was a great summary, and you alluded to the fact that during the meeting there was some discussion about actionability versus clinical utility. Um, maybe as one of the people in the anti-actionability subgroup of the meeting, I should just reinforce that a small group of people strongly objected to the emphasis on the actionability. Maybe Bob Nussbaum perfectly good terms of clinical validity and clinical utility. So we don't need a new term that reinforces some of the payment biases in medicine that we struggle with today that's procedure related and actionability related. I think it does more harm than good. So I was a little disappointed to see this term clin action group um, as opposed to something that's more neutral. Right. Well, I'll, I'll say two things about that. One is, is this was, uh, frankly, uh, an issue of time, uh, that in the, you know, the weekend between that meeting and this meeting, um, uh, we didn't uh, decide that a rebranding effort uh, was going to be uh, the best way to um, uh, use our time. The second thing is I'll say is that I, I don't think that there was generally consensus on that point. I think that there was debate on that point, and some of us were discussing the idea that there are things that clearly fall. W one of the problems with the term clinical utility is that for uh, uh, many people, particularly on the reimbursement side, that implies a very uh, high level of evidence um, before you really deem that something truly has clinical um, utility, where there are um, clearly things, uh, variants, where there is a defined action that you can do if you know that. Um, and the example that I would use is that um, uh, based on the currently available evidence, um, uh, I would probably not order CYP2C9 and VCOR C1 uh, variant testing as a, as a standalone test before starting a patient on warfarin. But if the patient walked in with that uh, genomic information, I would use it. So uh, I don't think that those warfarin things for many people would meet the, the level that we would um, uh, characterize as clinical utility, but they're clearly actionable. And it also is sensitive to the idea that uh, when the NHLBI had a related meeting, uh, this was a term that they felt very comfortable landing on. So I think that the, the takeaway is, is that we've got a, a bit more semantic work to do on this as well to make sure that we're understanding um, uh, what we're talking about. And it looks like David uh, Valley has some uh, comments as well. Hiding behind the Hi. Yeah. I would like to weigh in on this exact issue, which bothered me a little bit as I listened to your talk. I, to me, the term clinical actionability sounds like biology is black and white, and I don't think it is. I think except for a few high, uh, high, highly penetrant Mendelian uh, mutations, most variation in the human genome uh, acts by, in a, you know, interacts with a variety mm -hmm. of other variants. So. Um, to me, the term clinical uh, actionability makes it sound like it's very easy, black and white. Uh, if you see this, do this. If you don't see this, don't do this. And I like uh, a term like clinical utility, which seems to me to be much more nuanced. Mm 
Okay. And I think that this will be an important role uh, for, for this group to decide as well. And, and again, in the, in the relatively short time that I had to summarize, um, I, I apologize for characterizing this as that, uh, that we came out thinking that this is really a black and white world because clearly uh, that was not uh, the case. I think one of the reasons that um, there was such a strong feeling that we needed to focus on uh, genes that we currently understand well um, was uh, uh, around the idea that, uh, you know, we have a lot of things that we can do much better and things that we do understand reasonably well as opposed to all of the things that we really understand extremely poorly. And I think the other thing is, is that uh, it's clearly going to emerge into a situation where it's not just going to be uh, variant by variant, but there, we're also going to be looking at uh, groups of variants along with an associated clinical context that are going to determine how we use things. And so we do need to have that type of a uh, holistic approach to to thinking about it. But what we wanted to avoid was um, trying to work out the details of how this might work with things that we don't understand well, take the relatively small subset of things that we do understand well to work out sort of the general principles of what a resource like this might look like, and then we can allow that to scale. Um, over time as we gather more uh, knowledge that seems to be ready to move into the clinic. Erwin. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Catherine first. Um, so I actually think Nancy, the... if you ever could just identify yourself. Please. I'm sorry, I'm Catherine Nathanson from the University of Pennsylvania, Kate. Um, I actually think the example of BRSA 1 and 2 is an extremely important example because a lot of inroads have been made in this area and a lot of lessons have been, have been learned. Um, I think that, you know, it's important to realize, in fact, large international groups um, that are working on this area, there's a consortium called Enigma, uh, which has representatives from all, groups all over the world that have sort of done these, answered or tried to answer these questions for BRSA 1 and 2, and how do you address them, and what are the levels of evidence, and what are the different abilities to do this. And I think it's important in this context that we reach out and we reach out to our groups. And in fact, even uh, I think importantly, Larry Brody runs the Breast Cancer Information Core website for BRSA 1 and 2. They have, we have five levels of five levels already within that group. Um, and the uh, steering committee meets, talks about this every single month about how we classify variants. We've seen variants get to be more deleterious. We've seen variants go back from deleterious to not. Um, and I think one of the issues that you didn't bring up is the issue of how do we get information from um, uh, proprietary labs. Um, and I think that's a huge issue, not just for Myriad, which is the obvious example, but from something like Athena, which does sequencing for lots of many different genes. And how do we get that information? Because that is crucially important in this area. Yeah, yeah bo both of those things were discussed. Of course, one of the dangers of summarizing a two-day meeting in 15 minutes is that uh, there's a few things that will be left out. Um, and uh, both of the, the examples that you brought up were um, uh, were definitely talked about, and, and there was an extraordinarily strong feeling related to the second point, uh, that we have to find ways to um, uh, encourage people not to compete on the basis of proprietary information around variants, that this is something that is just critically important for everybody to understand. And in some ways, even if patents disappear, this type of um, proprietary control about uh, clinical information associated with variants will have uh, a very uh, challenging impact in terms of being able to develop tools that are going to allow uh, clinicians to use this information in a, in a proper way. And, and we clearly didn't come up with any solutions, but one of the suggestions that um, uh, did come out of the meeting that wasn't on the bulleted list here uh, was uh, that we needed to do a policy analysis related to uh, um, potential um, uh, things that policy um, uh, changes could, uh, could address, and that was one of the ones that was teed up very highly on that. Roman. Yeah, Mark, those are <clears throat> all critically important topics. I was just interested in um, what the group or the meeting actually brought out with regard to shifting the emphasis a little bit away from what you mentioned, there has been reimbursement and then clinically, clinical action related to reimbursement towards a more preventive medicine paradigm where perhaps somewhat different standards apply when we actually talk about you know, impact of clinical uh, of genomic information on uh, risk factors and assessment of risk factors and reclassification of risk uh, 
based on genomic information in the context of established traditional risk schemes, where I think you know the considerations are somewhat different, or have to be somewhat different than of what I hear uh, has been, you know, the, the the bar that's been applied for clinical actionability. Can you comment on that? Yeah, we certainly um, uh, talked about the idea that uh, some of the. Um, um, results of information could be applied in different ways, and uh, there's obviously the pharmacogenomic model where we're using this in, uh, in uh, uh, either to inform drug dosing, to avoid adverse events, uh, improve efficacy, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are clinical situations um, uh, where we're going to make a, a distinct clinical changes based on information, and then there's clearly information related to can we improve our risk estimates um, uh, to uh, do a better job of focusing on uh, preventive uh, efforts so that uh, given all of the preventive efforts that we could do on any individual person, how can we target the ones that are most important? And how does that impact the individual's behavior, which is a big question that we haven't been able to answer yet. Will this information, in fact, help us to address the, the, the problem that we've always had, which is it's very hard to change uh, behavior. So those things were, were, were talked about. I think you're right in the sense that um, uh, there, there may be some differences in terms of the bar. It, it, when you get into the actual um, uh, uh, reimbursement side of things, of course, the preventive stuff gets even more complicated because our biggest payer in the country, CMS, of course, specifically excludes coverage of preventive uh, interventions uh, because in 1965, when the law was passed, uh, prevention just doesn't didn't seem to be that important. Uh, there are some ways that they can get through this, but it really rep it, it represents an evidentiary level of the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which, which is probably the hot, one of the highest evidentiary bars uh, that we would have to deal with in the country. So it doesn't eliminate the issue of evidence, but I think those are the sorts of things where we need to figure out how can we really um, uh, get that um, information much more quickly to say this is really having a, a positive impact. And I should mention um, that one of the other things that came out that wasn't represented was the idea that we need to apply some of the new and emerging models of real world um, clinical trials. Uh, pragmatic clinical trials into the sphere, that we should be looking for ways to develop a suite of um, uh, trial methodologies that uh, are uh, well validated and could be used to um, uh, in projects such as this. Yeah, Dan. Mark, uh, uh, just a couple, of, I'm sorry I wasn't there. It was, it sounds like you obsessed a lot about BRCA1 and 2, as well you should. I, I want to be parochial for a second and, and, and make sure that the uh, the idea of sudden death susceptibility alleles didn't fall off the radar screen. This is a huge problem in the arrhythmia world because as we start to develop whole genome and whole exome sequencing, we're going to find people who have these variants. And the only thing you can, the only advice you can offer those people is you should get a defibrillator. It seems to me you know, irrational. And so I'd echo the idea that there needs to, a place for NHGRI might be to create these centralized resources so we know what happens to people who have these one-off uh, kind of variants and, and understand the relationship between genotype and phenotype a little bit better. No one center, probably no one country will be able to do that, but there seems to be some mechanism to look at these really rare variants and try to sort out which ones have been associated previously or are being associated with, uh, with, with bad outcomes. That may apply to BRCA1 and 2. It'll apply to all the sudden death susceptibility alleles yeah. and I'm sure to lots of others. Yeah, we, we definitely uh, had those come up as well as uh, the discovery of um, um, a surprisingly high number of um, what appear to be deleterious variants in genes uh, that are associated with malignant hyperthermia. Uh, and so there, there are those types of things that are, you know, clinically silent uh, up until a, a, a very terrible event occurs. Um, and I think in the broader sense, there was a real call for we have to do a better job of understanding phenotypes and gathering that type of information and uh, really understanding, okay, if we find this in one of these, uh, in a sodium channel gene, um, First of all, um, how do we enhance family history taking around that particular individual to better understand in a more traditional genetic sense what the prior probability or risk for sudden death would be? And then, and then how do we, um, uh, you know, how do we look at potential interventions? I mean, 
people were talking about beta blockers and this sort of thing, but I have the, I share the same concerns that you have. You know, if we're slapping defibrillators into everybody, which has been, you know, the approach that has been recommended, you know, we're going to be talking about a huge amount of introduced uh, morbidity and potentially even mortality and cost. And I'd love to talk about this yeah. Um, okay. And then Pearl after. Yes. So should could you introduce you know, yourself? Sorry, uh, Jonas Almeida from UAB. Should should we be looking at CleanVare as a decision neutral data source that we can use to advance research in in opposition to the class, the, the the clinical decision making uh, group? And also in, in, in relation with that, is it, what will be the relationship between CleanVare and dbGaP? and maybe with a resource like the TCGA portal where clinical information is also being added to the resource with no assumptions about decision making. Yeah, I think that um, the, the points that you're making are very good ones. There, different resources are going to have different opportunities to collect data. Um, uh, and uh, the quality of the data that's being collected, the confidence uh, with which we can attribute uh, uh, the data, I think will be important. But we're looking at, we have to be able to aggregate across all of the different efforts. I mean, there's, a, you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, uh, the, the ISCA um, uh, copy number variant database that's collecting clinical data. There's all sorts of places where people are doing this, but what we don't want to do is to have, you know, 55 different resources. I didn't project it, but there was a slide in our pre-meeting inquiry that we sent out saying, where do you go to find information? And there was this huge slide of the different resources that people are looking at. And it's clear that it's a lot of work to go all these different things, and that we're not always aware of everything that's happening. So in my view, the ideal would be that we're somehow capturing all of these under um, what is would be perhaps more fairly characterized as a service layer as opposed to a database. We're not, we don't import all the data into this resource, but there's access to all the data along with all the descriptors, the metadata about that data, which is if you, you know, are getting this from dbGaP, then what exactly are the circumstances under which, you know, so yes, we've seen this variant three times, but it turns out it's all members of the same family. So maybe that is something different than if we've seen it three times in 100,000 unrelated individuals. That's sort of information. Uh, time for one final question. Hi, thanks, David. Um, just listening to you, one thing I think we really have to have as an important partner here is um, the research oversight. I think the importance of as soon as this gets into the clinic that every individual is, sees themselves as requiring follow-up information, et cetera. So I think that's you know, a very important piece that oftentimes, as soon as it gets into the clinic, you know, what do you mean I have to do follow-up data? Yeah, and I think that um, that was something that uh, came across loud and clear. Um, the uh, clinical laboratorians are, you know, were expressing the concerns that they have that when they come across a variant that they've never seen before in uh, for a specific genetic test, then uh, they clearly want to go back and do more traditional genetic approaches to say, is this segregating with disease in a family, this type of thing. But it's unclear to them, you know, when do I step over the line um, from uh, clinical uh, information to research because it's not well defined. And so one of the outcomes of the meeting was the potential to interact with OHRP to ask them, could you issue a guidance uh, to help us define, you know, where we're doing? Now, well, yeah, well, I understand. Uh, you know, we all realize that that's in some ways tilting at windmills. But I'll tell you, we had a similar situation uh, with SACGHS where it was very unclear how family history uh, could be treated with an electronic health record in relation to HIPAA. And they wrote a beautiful guidance about family history that was way more liberal than any of us would have assumed that HIPAA would have allowed. It basically says if the patient gives it to you, you can do everything that you would in that patient record, including names, social security numbers, addresses. Uh, they didn't care. If the patient provided that to you, that was just fine, which eliminated a lot of the needs for things like shadow charts and all that sort of stuff. So, so if it happens, it can be extraordinarily useful, but I agree, getting that engagement and actually uh, getting a, a, a understandable answer is sometimes challenging, particularly in the, in the context that the whole new common rule, uh, advanced notice of proposed common rule is undergoing accelerated consideration at present. Thank you.